Okay, I think we're good. All right. Thank you everyone for calling into this and hopefully some of the other workshops we've had this weekend for our first ever virtual national organizing conference. I'm Pat Noble, one of the party's co-chairs and tonight we have with us Howie Hawkins, our presidential nominee for 2020. Howie, how's it going? It's going good. We're, we're throwing our punches, <laughs> trying to get a platform for the issues, which mm -hmm. has been like one of the most vacuous, issueless campaigns I've ever seen. Uh, thank you for calling in. I know you were in uh, New York this weekend, New York City campaigning. Yeah, on Friday, we went to the New York Stock Exchange and had a news conference saying that New York State should keep the stock transfer tax revenues mm -hmm. that have averaged $13 billion over the last 10 years. It's just about the deficit that the state now faces in this COVID depression. And Governor Cuomo won't keep that money. It's rebated right back to the Wall Street traders. And right there, it would mostly solve the fiscal gap. And then we went from there up to City Hall to do another statement, try to light a fire under City Council in de Blasio, so they'd light a fire under Cuomo. And the cops came up and said, what are you doing here? We haven't had a news conference here since the lockdown. And we didn't even try to go on the steps. We were in the park where you could see the City Hall. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know about the stock transfer tax, 13 billion a year over the last 10 years? They go, what? Never heard of it. I said, then I explained it to them. And they said, mm -hmm. have you ever thought about running for governor? <laughs> of course, I've run three times yeah. with that being a major <laughs> issue. But they, they were really interested. They mm -hmm. wanted the press release. And uh, so maybe I got some votes there. <laughs> and then, so that was uh, Friday. Yesterday, mm -hmm. we had a, a fundraiser in the Bronx and a live uh, broadcast. Margaret Kimberly talked about her book, Prejudential, which is about all the presidents and their racism throughout our history. And then I spoke about the campaign issues and we raised mm -hmm. some money. And today we marched with uh, a group of climate activists, indigenous people, Black Lives Matter people on a march for climate justice through racial justice mm -hmm. and how these issues intersect. And I was surprised at how good a reception we got. I remember in 2004, we came down to New York and marched with Peter Cameo, who was Ralph Nader's running mate that year. And people were coming up to us saying, what are you doing here? We're here to march against the war. No, this is about supporting John Kerry against Bush. And this was sponsored by United for Peace and Justice. I was saying, no, we're against the war, but we were getting heckled. I didn't get heckled today. I ran into a few people that wanted to settle for Biden, but uh -huh. surprisingly, most people were with us. They said they're uh -huh. going to vote for us. So that's a good sign because we're fighting for our life. You know, the ballot line in New York, we need 2% uh -huh. to stay on a ballot. It's basically triple what we used to have to get. Uh -huh. And uh, so, you know, they're trying to, the Democrats are trying to crush the Greens and the whole independent left. Uh -huh. They just want us to go away. They're challenging our ballot lines around yep. the country. Yeah. Yeah, they've been coming hard on the ballot so, access this year. What was it, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania? They succeeded there in those two states and also Montana. Okay. Uh, but we're still on over 30 ballots. Mm -hmm. We'll be right in in the rest of the states except those that don't count them, which mm -hmm. are South Dakota and Nevada. Mm -hmm. um, following the Socialist Party example, we're on the advisory vote in Guam. <laughs> and originally I was hoping to go out there. I have cousins in Hawaii who are Asian Pacific Islanders, and we mm -hmm. were going to do a trip to Guam and leaflet, you know, yep. the whole try to win Guam and make a statement, but the COVID uh, knocked that out. Yeah. So can't do it this time. Yeah, for everyone listening, um, four years ago, our party's ticket was on in Guam and it won, it won I think, 4% of the vote, something like that. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was people worried about climate change. And they yep. know they're not getting it from the Democrats and mm -hmm. Republicans because, yeah. you know, they're losing a lot of their land. Mm -hmm. to rising seas. Yeah, you, you, Democrats aren't going to do anything on the environment. Yeah, what, what Joe Biden the other was a week or two ago saying that you know, there's no reason we should get rid of fracking. You know, some quote like that. Yeah, he said, not now. Mm -hmm. Didn't really commit to any time. But you read his policy and the Democratic platform. Mm -hmm. And without saying it, they, they're basically saying we're going to frack the hell out of the country. Mm -hmm like we did under the Biden-Obama administration, mm -hmm. became the world's number one oil and gas producer. And they 
justify that by saying they're going to do carbon capture and sequestration, mm -hmm. which is uneconomical. You, you do that to the gas fired power plants and it's going to price them out. You know, wind and solar are much cheaper uh, when you add the carbon sequestration. Plus, you need a whole infrastructure, massive infrastructure. And it's dangerous because of that carbon leak um, leaks. It's heavier than the atmosphere and it'll suffocate people. Mm -hmm. So that's not going to happen without massive federal subsidies. And I don't think they're going to do it. So they're locking us into decades more gas burning, which is a climate disaster. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, I say Cuomo, I mean, Trump calls climate change a hoax, but Biden acts as if, it, as if it's a hoax. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't have a, you know, for example, the one number they give is they're going to retrofit 4 million buildings in the first four years, mm -hmm. or is it five years? In any case, you do the math, there are 120 million buildings in the country. It'll take them 150 years to retrofit all these buildings. It's way too late for climate change. So they're not serious. And even have, you know, AOC, Ed Markey, you know, trying to take the Green New Deal and I mean, it's never even gonna get passed in their version. You know, but, but holding up their version of the Green New Deal, which it, you know, doesn't come close to what we need right now. Yeah, that was a signature issue of the Green Party in the 80s. I was the first US candidate to run on it in 2010, running for governor. Jill Stein's theme for both of her campaigns was a Green New Deal for America, 2012, 2016. We ran on it again in New York in 2018. Then a week after the election, the Sunrise Movement with AOC sat in Pelosi's office. And in the corporate media paid attention. Good for them. And they called for a select committee on a Green New Deal, which would have had the power to put legislation on the floor. Mm -hmm. And Pelosi wasn't having that. So by the time the Congress came together, you had the marquee AOC non-binding resolution for a Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. They'd taken the slogan and diluted the content. They eliminated the ban on fracking and new fossil fuel infrastructure, which is the frontline demand of the climate movement. Mm -hmm. They eliminated the phase out of nuclear power. And now the Democratic platform for the first time in 50 years is saying we want to build more nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. And the cost of nuclear power now is two or three times higher than most forms of solar and wind. And Biden and Obama provided loan guarantees to the, the they, in Georgia and South Carolina, they tried to build six nukes. Four of them mm -hmm. have gone belly up due to uh, cost overruns and construction delays. And the only reason mm -hmm. The other two in Vogel, Georgia are still being worked on is because Brian Kemp stole the election from Stacey Abrams mm -hmm. by suppressing the black vote as secretary of state. And he's basically a creature of the Southern company, which is behind Georgia power. And so they're gouging the ratepayers to throw money down his boondoggle. So they eliminated the phase out of nuclear power. They eliminated the uh, deep cuts in military spending to help fund the Green New Deal. And then they extended the deadline to zero out carbon emissions from 2030 to 2050. And even then, Pelosi's never let them vote on it. McConnell, of course, said, oh, we're going to put all you senators running, you Democratic senators running for president on a record. Mm -hmm. So Markey and Schumer said, oh, that's a trick. We're going to vote president. And they all voted president, except four of the Democrats voted no with the Republicans. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get a Green New Deal from the Democrats. So then subsequently, AOC said, well, we'll come up with a plan, and she handed it off to the consensus think tank, which never came up with a plan. They wrote a few essays, and then the principals in that organization moved on to other think tanks. And now the words weren't even uttered at the Democratic Convention, Green New Deal. Mm -hmm. It's not in the platform. There is no Green New Deal coming from the Democratic Party. There's no serious climate plan. Of course, there's not coming from Trump either, so that's why... Yeah. We want to get at least a million votes for socialism in this election. That would be the mm -hmm. first time in American history. Mm -hmm. Debs came close twice, the last time 100 years ago, 1920. And we think that's one benchmark we have a really good shot of achieving. Mm -hmm. And that'll you know, send a message to ourselves that, hey, we got a broad movement here, a mm -hmm. million people. And that gives us a foundation on which to build. Because you know, the polls show if, if they hold up. And they've been holding up pretty steady since the spring. Biden's going to win the Electoral College in a landslide. But he's going to disappoint progressives, let alone socialists, 
I don't know how long the honeymoon will last, but people at some point are going to say, hey, we can't get anything out of this administration and that'll be our time. And so, you know, part of the purpose of this campaign is to get people better organized, more experienced and ready to, mm -hmm. you know, be responsive when people are looking for an alternative. Mm -hmm. I mean, and speaking of alternatives, it seems like your campaign, you know, one of the main messages is the left the unity of the million votes for socialism. You know, and you see your campaign getting more support across the left than any I can think of since Debs. Obviously, the Green Party's nomination, the Socialist nomination, um, Socialist Alternative, uh, Independent Socialist Group. I think you have three DSA locals now, which is unheard of. And all these groups that, for lack of a better way of saying it, usually don't get along too well with each other, all coming on board with the same campaign is really groundbreaking. You know, there's never been anything like it before now. Not in uh, recent decades, that's for yeah. sure. So yeah, that was one of our purposes. And we're saying this is a first date. It doesn't mean we're gonna get married and mm -hmm. merge, but after the election, you know, I think we should you know, try to get these groups together and, and talk mm -hmm. about, okay, where are we at and how do we move forward? <clears throat> the Greens, you know, one of the purposes is to get ballot lines. In about 40 of the states, the vote we get determines whether we have a ballot line going forward, but you know, that's one, two, three, or five percent in most states. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be tough in some states to do that. So, you know, we got to assess where we're at after the campaign and, and see how we can, you know, basically get back into politics. I mean, these challenges in Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, I mean, the Democrats have spun it like we're holding up the absentee balloting when they were. Mm -hmm. And I think they had collaboration with the Republicans in Wisconsin because they had everything they needed for a week to make a decision. And on the merits, as the dissenting opinion said, it was clear, the facts in the law said, Angela Walker and I should have been on the ballot, mm -hmm. no doubt. But what they did was say, well, now that we're making a decision, it's two days before the absentee ballot's supposed to be mailed, you're too late. Well, we weren't too late a week earlier, but they held up. So that's getting spun that way. Um, but the fact is, you know, we had partisan hacks in all these courts and all these boards of election voting party line. And what kind of country has the two governing parties presiding over their own election? You know, you go to Europe, the democracies in Asia, and they have independent agencies, nonpartisan, running the elections. Here we got, it's like Brian Kemp being Secretary of State suppressing the black vote. Here we got the two parties trying to game it mm -hmm. so that it's there to their advantage. So people say, well, there's Republican money behind the green petition drives. Well, yeah, I'm not surprised. We didn't ask them to do that. They, they did it in Montana. Um, so they're trying to game it. And of course, the Democrats are trying to get us off the ballot by trivial uh, challenges. Like in Pennsylvania, we got double the number of signatures we got needed, I think we needed 5,000. We got, I think, um, almost 10,000. And the Democrats challenged 5,000 of those signatures, which required us to hire a lawyer and get a lot of volunteers and spend three weeks documenting our signatures. And then when we met with the board, the Democrats saw what we'd done and they said, okay, we'll just drop that objection. And they, they, they rested their case and were successful on some paperwork that was screwed up by mm -hmm. one of the uh, candidates who was a favorite daughter standing in on a petition for right, right. the, because they started petitioning before the formal nomination by the mm -hmm. Green Party. So, you know, they got us on a, on a little paperwork thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's no justice in that because the people that are hurt are the voters. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, the, the voters, all, all the people that put in you know, all the hours to actually, you know, get the signatures, try to get you on the ballot in the first place. Right. Yeah, so, you know, party suppression by the Democrats is a form of voter suppression. You know, they think they're gonna gain in Wisconsin by this. I wonder, you know, Angela Walker got 67,000 votes running for sheriff in Milwaukee. She's a uh -huh. native daughter of black Milwaukee. Uh -huh. How do those people feel that the Democrats just threw off the ballot? Uh -huh as well as progressives across the state. You know, a lot of people are just gonna, just gonna reinforce their disgust with the both parties. 
And you know who wins every election is the non-voters. Mm -hmm. There are 100 million people didn't vote in 2016, disproportionately working class, people of mm -hmm. color and young people. Mm -hmm. That's the future of the left. Yeah. Those are the people we've got to connect to. And that's why you know we talk about a mass party with grassroots organizations in these communities. So people, they don't just hear our message at election time. They, they see us active on the issues. We go out and don't preach at them. We listen, mm -hmm. find out what their concerns are, build relationships, friendships. So then when it comes to politics, they know we're on, we're on the side of the people. Mm -hmm. And it's that grassroots organization that I think the left needs to refocus on. You know, when we went from the old left to the new left, and I'm a child of the new left, I think we were over impressed by what we did with street demonstrations, mm -hmm. civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement. And we threw the baby out with the bathwater because we're not building mass organizations. We're all sort of looking online for what the next instructions are from these nonprofits. They're not democratic, you know, some billionaire liberals hire this, you know, hire, set up the organization, they hire staff, staff sits around a table and decides what the strategy is. And it tends to be channeling people into voting for Democrats as the lesser evil. And, you know, I think the left has to take the advice of old Amakar Cabral, a great African revolutionary, Guinea-Bissau, who had a, a saying, tell no lies, claim no easy victories. Mm -hmm. You got to tell the people the truth. You know, this last week, there was a group of old environmentalists, I call them aging environmentalists like me, who uh, mostly for people that were around starting the Earth Day. They claimed to have been in there to start a clamshell. I was there. None of the people signing were there that I recognized. But anyway, they said, don't vote for the Green Party. And one of the things I, I said in there, and they tried to, you know, make Biden out to be somebody we could work with. And of course, as we just talked about, Biden's climate policy is terrible. Mm -hmm. So I said, we got to stop calling defeats victories because then people get disillusioned because they realize nothing's happening. But on the hopeful side, you know, the young people, the Extinction Rebellion people, people like that we were talking to today, they get it. And I think uh, the other encouraging thing is the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, this was a anti-racist movement where a lot of white people came out in solidarity and are still coming out. And that's something new. I mean, some people supported civil rights when they saw what happened at Selma and on Pettus Bridge. But this was, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands on the streets. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, it was heartfelt. People saw George Floyd murdered, lynched on TV, mm -hmm. and they were outraged. And they came out and expressed that. So I, I think that's something we can build on. That's a good harbinger for the future. And it seems like especially this election with you know, with someone as uninspiring as Joe Biden, the Democrats have nothing to offer, no new policies, nothing radical, nothing progressive. The best, thing, the best thing they can do to get people to vote for them is to kick campaigns like yours off of the ballot to try to limit the choices. You know, just keep people in, you know, with their blinders on where it's either us versus Trump and you got to vote for us. And there's no, there's nothing inspiring or positive about their messaging. It's just vote shaming people into supporting them. Yeah, well, my, my answer to the progressives and the socialists is shame on you if you vote for Biden. You know, we have a two front anti-Trump uh, campaigns going on here. And the stronger anti-Trump, anti-fascist vote is the green vote. Mm -hmm. And the more votes and the green and socialist vote. And the more votes we get, the less Biden can take the left, the independent left for granted. If uh, everybody folds up and just votes for Biden and we get a small vote, then Biden's going to think, I got all the left in my pocket. You know, they're not going to vote for the Republicans. They don't threaten to go anywhere else. So I can ignore them. So, you know, I say if you're a progressive and you vote for Biden, if you're a progressive, you want Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. You want a Green New Deal. You want to end the endless wars. You want to legalize marijuana and end the war on drugs and a whole lot of other things. And you vote for Biden, he's against all those things. Mm -hmm. You get lost in the sauce. <laughs> you know, you voted for Biden. Nobody knows that you want Medicare for all, but you vote for the Green and Socialist mm -hmm. candidates. Everybody knows we want Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows, you know, we want a real Green New Deal and so forth. 
And of course, within the movement, you know, we've been emphasizing in the Medicare for All, for example, you know, we don't want like in the Sanders bill, uh, room for <clears throat> private insurance to subcontract. We've seen that what, you know, has happened in the National Health Service in the UK where they, in the name of efficiency, bring in competition and they end up with more bureaucracy. Or like in this country, Andrew Cuomo here in New York, I forget the statistics now, but like the number of hospitals, public hospitals been cut in half in the last 20 years. And because of the competition, the public sector runs lean like it's the private sector to maximize you know, profits or at least get customers in that environment. Mm -hmm. So when the COVID crisis comes along, they don't have the resources to respond. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the problem with privatization. So we're talking about not just socializing only the payment through a single public payer, socializing mm -hmm. the delivery. Mm -hmm. So we have a fully socialized healthcare system. We call it a community controlled national health service with the mm -hmm. hospitals and clinics being publicly owned, the mm -hmm. doctors, the nurses, and the other healthcare workers being public employees. Mm -hmm. And they answer to us through locally elected health district boards so that we can make sure every community has the proper healthcare resources and they're responsive to our needs. Mm -hmm. And then they federate from that level to the state and national level. So that you know, we had legislation like that. Uh, Ron Dellums introduced it back in the 70s when the choice was between the Nixon bill, which was mandates for private insurance, like we got with Obamacare. Mm -hmm. There was a Kennedy bill, that's single payer, national health insurance, they used to call it. And then the Dellums bill, which was written by <clears throat> veterans of the Medical Committee for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. Then the 60s was patching people up after they got beat in the civil rights movement or the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. And they came up with a great bill. It's called the Josephine Butler United States Health Service. Mm -hmm. And Dellums had it in there and then Barbara Lee carried it until uh, I think it was 2013. After Obamacare passed, she dropped it. Mm -hmm. So that legislation needs to be brought back. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's not going to happen now until we elect a Green or Socialist to the Congress. So that's, uh, that's one of many issues where we need to get into the, into the politics mm -hmm. in a real way. What, what do you say to the people that are either supporting your campaign or they're on the fence about what they're going to do? And with all the issues in the election, now we're throwing um, a potential Supreme Court nomination into the mix with um, uh, Ginsburg passing away on Friday. Now you've got one more thing for the Democrats to come out and say, my God, you've got to get our guy in there. You've got to vote for Joe Biden, assuming Trump doesn't get his nominee in beforehand. But do, do you think that changes the messaging a little bit, changes the dynamic of how you have to sell the campaign to voters, especially undecided people? Well, we're, we're demanding that there be no uh, nomination or, uh, yeah, nomination yeah. and yeah. approval by the Senate uh, until the new Congress and president take office. And there's historical precedent for that. Like Lincoln had an opportunity right before the 1864 election. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, it's too late. Uh, that was October 1st, mm -hmm. a little bit earlier than now, but a little bit later than now, but he said it would be wrong to do that. And I believe there's another president that had that uh, decision facing them and they waited. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we got Murkowski and Collins. Now right. we got to push people like Romney and uh, the guy in Colorado. Um, there are a bunch of them in close races, Arizona, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because they, they could, you know, win moderate votes mm -hmm. if they uh, say, you know, it'd be a good political move by them. But mm -hmm. they, of course, they're feeling it from the Trump side. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, we can't wait for Biden to get elected. If Trump mm -hmm. get, pulls this off, it's too late, mm -hmm. which comes back on the Democrats. You know, why mm -hmm. the hell didn't they come up with a serious impeachment earlier, much earlier? You know, Trump has been hurting working people, consumers, the environment. He's got a rap sheet a mile long. Mm -hmm. self-enrichment, nepotism, racism in violation of anti-discrimination and civil rights laws. I mean, they could have made a real case and mobilized the public. Instead, Pelosi didn't want to do that for a long time because she wanted to protect her members of Congress that were elected in purple districts. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to change and persuade people, they were accepting you know, the, where people are at now and accommodating that instead of fighting the right. That's, mm -hmm. you know, that goes back to Clinton, triangulation. Mm -hmm. They don't fight the right, they accommodate it. And, and Biden 
says that's one of his calling cards. That's one of his strengths. Mm -hmm. You know, early in the campaign, he was bragging about how he worked with Strom Thurmond. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day when they were fighting busing. Well, busing for desegregation. There was plenty of busing going on back then. Yeah, yeah. But he he didn't. In fact, in one quote, he said he didn't want his kids going to school in a racial jungle. I mean, mm -hmm. shh. you know, and when Clinton was running uh, in '92. He unveiled his law and order program at Stone, Morton, Stone, Stone Mountain, Georgia, the spiritual home of the Ku Klux Klan, where they got the visages of uh, Jefferson Davis and Stonewall Jackson and Robert E. Lee carved into Stone Mountain. It's like they're Mount Rushmore. And he's at the correctional facility at Stone Mountain with a bunch of prisoners behind him, most of them black, lined up in their suits, you know, their striped suits or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, Trump hasn't even done something so blatant, you know. That was, you know, a real signal from Bill Clinton who felt our pain. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not sure if he didn't feel our pain that much more than, than Donald Trump does. So, um, yeah, relying on the Democrats to fight the right is mm -hmm. the wrong thing. And that's, I think, true right now. We can't wait for Biden. So, you know, I'm telling people, yeah. you got to vote for what you want to make the politicians come to mm -hmm. you. And certainly in states like New Jersey, where you're from, or New mm -hmm. York, where I'm from, Trump is toast. I mean, there's no mm -hmm. question who's going to win. And I don't know what the polls say in New Jersey. In New York, he's been 25 points ahead or more. Mm -hmm. So shame on any socialist or progressive that votes for Biden in, in New York. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you basically just supported a very conservative mm -hmm. hawk right. for the presidency. I mean, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Now I can understand if it's you know in you're in a state where it's close. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to shame or scold people that decide you know they want to defeat Trump. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Although I will argue that you know for the Greens for the Socialists every state is a battleground. Mm -hmm. You know who do we fight when we're fighting fracking or for mm -hmm. affordable housing in the cities where the real estate machine is behind the Democratic machine? Mm -hmm. It's the Democrats. You know, I was talking to this about this with Kali Akuno from Jackson, Mississippi. And he said, you know, they want us to turn these so-called battleground states into sacrifice zones mm -hmm. where the left is crushed and can't fight back because it doesn't have a battle line. So, you know, that I urge people wherever to vote for the left and let's build this movement. But like I said, you know, if they decide in a close state, they got to vote for Biden. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say, well, we're never going to talk again. We're just going to talk after the election and, you know, say, okay, now how do we move forward? It actually looks like we just had a question from one of the people in um, on the Zoom webinar. Um, and if anyone wants to ask who's listening on Facebook, we're watching that as well. Uh, Claudia, one of our vice chairs asked, are there more plans to confront the ongoing suppression of ballot access or have the options for legal recourse already been exhausted? In uh, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, my understanding is they have. Um, our lawyer in Pennsylvania is definite on that. Uh, I'm not sure we talked to the lawyers we had in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. if there is an option. Mm -hmm. Although I suggested to my campaign manager, the Democrat who presided over the election Wisconsin, Wisconsin Election Commission hearing mm -hmm. on the objections to our petition did not let us present our documentation that we did everything to a T as far as, see what happened was Angela Walker moved across town in Florence, South Carolina during the petitioning period. So some petitions had her original address and some had her later address after she moved, which is what they told us to do. And then they wanted an affidavit from her uh, notarized showing she what her current address was, which was on her declaration of candidacy or declaration of intent, whatever they called that form in Wisconsin. We couldn't present that in the hearing, which then required us to go to court and extended the whole process. Mm -hmm. There must be some law against that kind of malfeasance and abuse of power. So I, that's what I asked, you know, can we, can we, you know, sue her or sue the commission for, you know, violating their own law. I, I don't know the answer to that, but, you know, I, I don't want to just let them get away with this without, you know, at least fighting back any way we can. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where we're at. There are some states like Oklahoma, I think one of the cases in Montana, 
Nevada, Arizona, where we're in court, but it won't be resolved by the election. So we're trying to set precedents. Okay. Like in Oklahoma, they want a $35,000 filing fee. And the next highest filing fee is, I think, $2,500 for U.S. Senate, statewide election. So that, you know, that's like a poll tax for a mm -hmm. campaign like ours right. that we couldn't pay. So that's in court and uh, probably won't be resolved by the election. So there's ongoing fights for ballot access mm -hmm. that may not yield in this election, but hopefully in the future. What's it been like um, campaigning during the pandemic? I mean, you've run a lot of campaigns and certainly, you know, the in-person events, the handshaking, it's all very different this time around. Yeah, it is. Um, instead of being on the road barnstorming, mm -hmm. I've been on Zoom calls like this. Mm -hmm. And actually during the green primaries, and there were 47 of them, I probably talked to more people this way than I could have where I'm you know, driving halfway across the state one day or halfway across mm -hmm. the country, I'm flying, a lot of travel time. And then the local people got to pull people together and that requires work on their part. It was, I think kind of worked out well for the primary season. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we have different groups of people want to talk to us. So, you know, like local DSA chapters, mm -hmm. like uh, refugees from the Bernie Sanders campaign. Mm -hmm. And instead of having to, you know, fly here, there and everywhere to meet mm -hmm. with these people, we just get on Zoom. Yeah. So that's been good. On the other hand, there's a poll out. It shows our, our best uh, results are in small cities. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why that is, but small cities are where, you know, a third party presidential campaign can get media attention, mm -hmm. particularly in states that are not battlegrounds. Mm -hmm. So if I go to Wichita, Kansas, which people assume Trump's going to win Kansas, mm -hmm. A presidential candidate, Trump and Biden ain't going to Kansas. Same thing in New York. You know, they're not fighting over New York. They, mm -hmm. you know, Trump's conceded that to Biden. Mm -hmm. So I will be going around and have been going around New York State. You know, you go to Plattsburgh, New York. I went up there. This is before the COVID pandemic, but I got like 13 media hits. The Fox TV came over from Burlington, Vermont on the ferry. Mm -hmm. um, we got all the newspapers, all the radio stations, all the TV stations, NPR, Spectrum, everybody. It's big news in Plattsburgh. Mm -hmm. And so that we're missing because that's, uh, that's uh, a way we could get attention in the smaller media markets. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for news. So we're news to them, mm -hmm. which is not the case for the big you know, cable networks and the broadcast networks. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Kyle in our um, Central Oregon local for the Socialist Party. Uh, Kyle wrote, fires in the Northwest are acute and more frequent. It seems much of the forests that are burning are privately owned by logging companies. Does the Green New Deal or do you have a plan to address the immediate need to change the climate in this specific area? So they're saying that the forests burning out West are mostly on private land? Uh, much of the forests that are burning are privately owned by logging companies. Mm. Well, and I also know much of it's National Forest Service that the logging companies have contracts or permits to log in. So, yeah, forest management needs to be much more uh, publicly accountable. Right now, it's accountable to the logging companies, mm -hmm. you know, who will clear cut, which causes erosion problems. And... Uh, it creates habitat problems. Mm -hmm. So like agriculture, where we want to go to organic regenerative agriculture, it may be less efficient in terms of labor time, but it's more efficient in terms of sustaining the environment mm -hmm. and in terms of quality of product we get, particularly with agriculture. So that, um, you know, this is something under democratic social ownership and control you know, the public can decide, do they want more organic food and less, uh, you know, highly processed, industrialized, corporate agriculture food? And the same thing with the forest. Mm -hmm. And 
while you know in a state like Oregon, the, the logging industry is powerful and people employed in it tend to you know want to you know keep it going the way it is because they got mm -hmm. a job. Right. There are a lot of people in Oregon who are not happy about how the forests are managed. And if we had democratic control, at least we'd have a debate. Right now, mm -hmm. it's the regulatory agencies are the you know uh, except for real hardcore activists who are defending the forest. Most people have no idea what goes on there. It's not transparent. Mm -hmm. And some of the rules are written in Washington, not out in, in the communities mm -hmm. or the states where it's happening. So, you know, that's to say we need democratic ownership and control. And we need to exercise our ownership rights on our commonwealth, which are the national forests. And we mm -hmm. basically just hand it over to the logging companies to do as they will. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that question applies as well to the public lands where the private companies basically have been given permits. And uh, you see that in mining. I know one of Ralph Nader's big kicks is the, the, the royalties or the uh, fees we uh, charge for mines are so, I mean, they're using prices back from the 19th century. So it's basically mm -hmm. free to these companies. Mm -hmm. And they are you know, extracting public wealth Mm -hmm. private profit and so that's another area um mining logging the whole area of natural resource management mm -hmm. all right looks like we have another question from penelope uh who wrote the poor people's campaign has recently contacted both trump and biden for statements regarding the working poor biden provided a response but trump did not has the Poor People's Campaign contacted the Hawk and Walker campaign? No, never, although we have contacted them. Um, and I've been on the road a few days, but that's worth looking at. And we can respond to them whether they want, to, want us to or not and give them our response. Mm -hmm. And this is regarding the working poor. Yeah, actually, we got a program to deal with that. It's called the Economic Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. A job guarantee, a guaranteed income above poverty, which was Dr. King's big thing in the Poor People's Campaign, Medicare for all, lifelong public education from pre-K and child care to post-secondary college, trade school, continuing adult education, mm -hmm. a secure retirement by doubling social security benefits. So no senior lives below the poverty line and no seniors working after retirement age if uh, you know they're willing to live on a, what double social security is. Mm -hmm. And finally, a housing program. I mean, we're, we're about to enter into probably the worst housing crisis we've ever had when these moratoriums end up and people can't pay the rent that's piled up or their mortgages that have piled up. So we are calling for 25 million units of public housing over the next 10 years mm -hmm. to house all the homeless and all the low-income people that can't afford affordable housing. That's about 10 million people. And we say 25 million because we want to have public housing that's high quality mixed income like they do in Europe. You got mm -hmm. professionals and middle income working people as well as low income people living together. The way we were doing public housing before we stopped doing it from World War II to the early 1970s was put all the poor people of color in a big project in the worst part of town with no access to resources and uh, increase segregation. So we want to do it in a way to desegregate and we want to do it on a scale that solves the problem. You know, here Bernie Sanders and AOC had a Green New Deal public housing program, but it was only 2.5 million units. And it was a lot of rehab of existing units, which needs to be done, that's good. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't scaled up. You know, back when they passed the Fair Housing Act in uh, 1968, they passed companion legislation to build 25 million units of affordable housing. People tell us mm -hmm. we're crazy. Well, Congress, authorized that back in 1968. Mm -hmm. The problem is, instead of doing it the most cost-effective way, which is public housing, they did a, what they called a public-private partnership, which basically means the public pays private developers to build affordable housing, so it's publicly subsidized that way. Mm -hmm. And then they didn't get built because Nixon, because part of the purpose in the legislation was desegregation and Nixon didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So the whole program was killed, but you know, people talk about neoliberalism or privatization uh -huh. as if it's only the Republicans. That was the Johnson administration. 
that's when they started to turn away from public provision of public needs mm -hmm. and also public enterprise where it's justified. So that's when, for example, and this is one of the things that radicalized me, my little uh, postal banking account, I had to, you know, liquidate it because in 67, Johnson eliminated postal banking, which is a form of public banking we need to bring back so that the unbanked have a low cost way of, you know, getting their checks cash without getting gouged mm -hmm. um, and putting their savings in an account without having all these fees and minimum amounts that the commercial banks want. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, the Democrats are no slouches when it comes to privatization. In fact, they seem to be able to get away with more of it than the Republicans can. It's kind of like Nixon goes to China and the Democrats go to even more extreme capitalism. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have a question from Joshua in our um, Socialist Party's Northern Piedmont local. Uh, Joshua wrote, how will the campaign deal, or how is the campaign dealing with the corporate media blockade? How should we try to get the word out better in light of this? Yeah, that's that's even bigger problem than ballot access. And we have been locked out even more than Jill Stein was in 2016. Mm -hmm. For example, MSNBC, Alex Witt had Jill Stein on a few times. They had Jill Stein commenting on cable during the Democratic Convention. We couldn't, we couldn't get that. They did those climate uh, town halls back in September of 2019. I'm the original Green New Dealer. You'd think, even if they didn't put me in the town hall, they'd do a segment on that. Mm -hmm. You know, might in make the discussion more interesting. We did get some reporters and even some hosts. You know, they, they were interested, but the producers make the decisions and they they locked us out. Mm -hmm. So what people can do is write to these various outlets. And it's not just big corporate media. It's democracy now. Mm -hmm. It's NPR. NPR had a segment after the Libertarian got the nomination. They have yet to have one on, on our ticket. So, you know, write to these outlets and saying, when the hell are you going to cover Howie Hawkins and Angela Walker? Mm -hmm. You know, and, you know, they, if enough people do that, they do want to keep their audience pleased. So the advertisers aren't mad at them. Mm -hmm. People say, well, public radio is public. No, <laughs> they got ads on there, you know, all the time. It's, mm -hmm. it's really changed. So they're all commercial now. Mm -hmm. Um, well, democracy now is not, but, you know, they, they should cover the whole spectrum. We, we right. haven't got anything from them. In fact, mm -hmm. it kind of repeated the Democratic spin on Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. From what I'm told, I haven't seen the segment. But, uh, yeah, it's it's been rough. So the other thing we're doing is, you know, getting on podcasts. Some of them, you can write to them, too. Mm -hmm. um, we responded to Charlemagne the God when... Uh, Biden gave him that, what did he say? He said something really objectionable. Maybe that's where he said, you know, if black people don't vote for me, they ain't black. Yeah. He I said think what that's he told Charlemagne yeah. the God. So Angela wrote a great response and uh, we sent it to him. He never responded to us. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other podcasters. It got decent audiences. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've been doing podcasts constantly, you know, since the lockdown. Right. This before. And you know, it's getting around, but, you know, we tend to get the the smaller left wing or, you know, sort of independent play on both your houses uh, kind of podcast. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we take advantage of that. But we could use we should get on some of these bigger megaphones. Mm -hmm. So what people can do is write to them and say, you know, not just, you know, you should cover these guys because it's right. Cover these guys because they're interesting. They mm -hmm. got things to say. They got important issues. Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has their doomsday clock the closest it's ever been to midnight mm -hmm. because of this new nuclear arms race that the U.S. Uh, instigated with its nuclear modernization program, which Biden mm -hmm. supports as much as Trump, the Democrats as much as the Republicans. Mm -hmm. And we have a way out of that, peace initiatives, deep cuts in military spending, orderly withdrawal from our 800 foreign military bases, in 14 wars where we have combat troops engaged right now. Mm -hmm. People don't know there are that many. There are. 
a lot of them are small, but they're, you know, places in Africa, the Philippines, as well as the Middle East and North Africa. Um, pledge no first use of nuclear weapons. And then go to the other nuclear powers and say, we're no longer threatening you. Uh, these weapons should never be used because it'll kill all of us. And let's have mutual and complete disarmament and go there with world public opinion. 122 nations have agreed to the text of a new treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. The International Campaign for the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons got the Nobel Peace Prize for that. Hardly anybody in this country knows that because the leadership of both parties, their presidential candidates and the corporate media stenographers don't talk about it. It's a life or death existential issue. And there's no discussion. The last bilateral treaty between the United States and Russia expires next February 5th. That concerns strategic arms. Mm -hmm. And there's been a little discussion of that, but it's not like Biden has said, you know, I, I'm going to go, you know, get that treaty renewed and uh, it's a huge issue. It's just not being discussed. And it's mm -hmm. a major issue that any other country with a half decent media would force the candidates to discuss. Mm -hmm. But instead, you know, Trump kind of sets the agenda. He tweets and Fox retweets and MSNBC and CNN say, oh, how horrible. And it's all about Trump. Mm -hmm. And the real issues aren't being talked about. Oh, here's our next one um, from uh, Mike in Biloxi. Mm -hmm. uh, he asked, um, what are your thoughts on reforming or eliminating the Electoral College? Oh, man. I mean, <laughs> I, every time I get told I'm spoiling it for Biden, I say, no, he's spoiling it. And the Democrats are spoiling it. Because even before Nader, we've been giving the proven nonpartisan solution to spoil presidential elections. Mm -hmm. And that is to replace the Electoral College with a ranked choice vote, national popular vote for president. And you would think the Democrats, who have not lost to a Republican by the popular vote, at least when the Republican was first elected, and instead you get the Electoral College putting the right-wing losers in the office, Bush and then Trump, you would think the Democrats would say, hmm, that's a problem for us. Mm -hmm. The Electoral College distorts the results. And instead they spend all their time trying to keep the Greens off the ballot which tends to alienate people. You know, most of our voters are out to vote for us. Mm -hmm. They are not wayward Democrats. 61% of the votes for uh, voters for Jill Stein in 2016, according to the exit polls, mm -hmm. would have stayed home if she was not on the ballot. Mm -hmm. You plug that number into Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, wouldn't it change the results? Mm -hmm. So the Democrats are going after the wrong problem. So yeah, the Electoral College needs to be abolished. And, you know, Bill McKibben in, in the New Yorker about a year ago now said, I should drop out and campaign uh, for ranked choice voting. You know, if I wasn't in the election, it wouldn't even be raised. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that's an issue where we're gaining. We got 23 cities and counties that do it. The state of Maine is doing it, including for the uh, electoral vote in this election. It's on the ballot in Massachusetts. I think it's an idea whose time has come. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think we're actually gaining on electoral reform. It, we've actually got in most states, uh, the, the petitioning requirements lowered, uh, the deadlines made more reasonable. Um, you know, Richard Winger at Ballot Access News, who I know, you know, socialists mm -hmm. know as well as Greens is right. He's the man. He's been on this issue for decades and we're slowly making progress. So I think that's an area where we need to keep going. It's going to come from the bottom up, cities and counties, then states. And as more people become familiar with ranked choice voting, they'll say, yeah, why don't we elect the president that way instead of the electoral college, which, you know, most people still don't get, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't understand that, uh, you know, they just think their vote counts in the national popular vote because mm -hmm. people aren't paying that close attention. And it, it's not the case. So, yeah, Electoral College has got to go and the Democrats haven't made it an issue, which is, you know, a real problem. Yeah. They, they have the platform. They could have done something about it and they haven't. 
Right. Uh, next, we have a question from Vince, um, a socialist member in New Jersey. Very nice. Uh, Vince wrote, in light of the recent death of um, Ginsburg, I'm curious to know what, a, what the Supreme Court would look like under a green or socialist presidency if the Supreme Court is to exist under a uh, green or socialist presidency. Well, I think we'd appoint uh, somebody who was not a economic neoliberal, which Clinton did. There was a study that came out in 2004 from Fordham Law School in one of their, in their journal. And it looked at the Reagan Bush appointees versus the Clinton appointees. It was actually Clinton appointees were more conservative because a lot of what goes on before the Supreme Court has to do with corporate regulations. Mm -hmm. And the Democratic appointees like Stephen Breyer were very, they might as well have come from the Cato Institute, mm -hmm. you know, anti-regulation and, you know, pro-corporate. So that would be a big difference. Of course, we'd be for the civil rights and individual rights, you know, the right of a woman to choose whether or not to have an abortion, uh, equality for LGBTQIA folks, no question there. Mm -hmm. More strict on civil rights, you know, we'd have, we wouldn't appoint somebody who would have said the pre-clearance provision of the Voting Rights Act was unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Obviously, what's happened since that was removed makes it real clear it is necessary, probably in more areas, jurisdictions than it was before they removed it. Because mm -hmm. now we've seen it in places like Wisconsin where they got photo ID, which, you know, disproportionately affects black Milwaukee, where a lot of people use public transit, don't have driver's licenses, mm -hmm. but also there, you know, the student vote in Madison, it's huge. It's predominantly democratic, but they won't accept stu uh, student IDs. You know, all those kids got cars. So, mm -hmm. you know, that was very calculated on the part of Republicans. So that's the kind, you know, states like that, having done that, you know, they should be under the preclearance provision. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's legislation that can be passed. Mm -hmm. So I think the difference is between the Democrats who are, who probably produce social liberals, although uh, Merrick Garland was not that liberal. He was really a middle of the road or at best, mm -hmm. pretty conservative guy, like the Clinton appointees. That was mm -hmm. going to be Obama appointee. Um, you know, we would have people that were, you know, very strong on, on human rights, civil rights, as well as the right of the people to regulate mm -hmm. economic uh, activity, which we don't have anybody strong on the court now for that, which is a, you know, a real change from uh, what we had with the Warren Court and some of those folks, you know, like Justice Douglas and Justice Black. Okay, next question, <clears throat> excuse me, is from uh, Kristen in Minnesota, uh, who wrote, in Minnesota, we have a great opportunity to promote left unity with the Socialist Party, Socialist Alternative, Legal Marijuana Now, and the Green Party all endorsing or nominating you and Angela. What do you think is the strongest unifying thread or best approach to empowering this coalition to work together to promote the campaign? Well, I think uh, the leadership should should meet and you know figure out how to do that practically. Um, maybe a broader conference or Zoom call with you know the membership mm -hmm. once they've you know got some something to offer, and then it's just old fashioned, you know, canvassing which you can do by phone. You can do socially distanced street canvassing. Put on your mask, knock on the door, step back, mm -hmm. and have a conversation, um, and. That's the best thing. I mean, in my experience, people just appreciate the fact that you came. And if you don't preach at them too much, but listen, I mean, a lot of people just pour their heart out. And then they won't even know what you stand for. But the fact that you listen is so different from what they get from the major parties. It's like, well, okay, you listen to me. I'm going to vote for you just because of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, but what you want to do is, you know, get the names. You know, we're going on a five-point system. I prefer a three-point. They're with you. You don't know, or they're against you. And then you work the ones, and if you got time, you try to persuade the twos. Mm -hmm. We're going with the five points. So we got strong, lean, neutral, lean the other way, strong the other way. Mm -hmm. But whatever system you use, then take names. And you can use them going forward. 
You know, it's really important to get contact so we can communicate with the email today. It's, it's practically free. Um, you know, it depends on the scale. Sometimes you have to pay a service to do the larger scale emails, but uh, you can easily communicate with people and they respect the fact that you care enough about them to tell them what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you should not be discouraged if they don't, you know, come back and come to the meetings and come to the demonstrations. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are just checking you out or, you know, they're in a situation where they're working two jobs or they just had a kid and, you know, just life circumstances, they can't get involved. And then you'll mm -hmm. find, you know, five years later, suddenly their circumstances have changed and they always want to get involved and they show up. But if we don't talk to them, they don't think we care about them. Mm -hmm. So, I think taking names is really important, not just for getting out the vote on election day, but continuing to organize. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing they need to be doing in Minnesota and where they decide to do it, you know, each organization does it itself, you know, share the contacts with our campaign so we can do the national messaging mm -hmm. and then do your local messaging. And election day is just one day. I mean, one thing we need to talk about is, you know, whatever the election day vote is there's going to be a lot of mail-in ballots counted and you know one of the nightmare scenarios is trump has a narrow popular vote or votes in some states that on election day is ahead but by the time the mail-in ballots are, are, are he's behind and he's going to say it was rigged and the mail-in ballots are crooked he's already setting that up and he's inciting these ragtag white racist vigilante groups we're just looking for an excuse to hurt some people mm -hmm. and they've done some of it around black lives matter mm -hmm. they can do a lot more i don't think they can change the result but they can hurt a lot of people and in the confusion that just gives fuel to this irrational right-wing movement we got now that believes a lot of them the q and conspiracy mm -hmm. nonsense and you know the deep state and trump's the only guy standing in the way um and they're buying yeah, and then, into that. Not to, not to cut you off, but actually the, the next question sort of goes into that, asking, you know, what should people do, you know, in response to, you know, these more, you know, these far right groups that are becoming more prominent, more militant, more violent. Yeah, but what, what do you think the response to that should be? Well, we should be uh, out there on election day, um, you know, finding out what uh, election integrity efforts are going on in your community. It may be they need more poll workers so they can open up more polling places. Because in this pandemic, a lot of the older folks are saying, I'm not going out this year. So they have to reduce the number of polling places. And given the bias in a lot of these state governments or county boards of election, they're gonna reduce them in uh, black and other minority communities. Or if it's a Republican jurisdiction, you know, a campus community, although I don't know how much of a factor that is this election with a lot of campuses not open or opening and closing. But in any case, we got to watch that. So poll workers, election integrity defense. I got a report today that some people were showing up in Virginia for early voting. I'm not sure it was accurate, but maybe it was a rumor that, you know, some white vigilante showed up to intimidate people. Mm -hmm. If it didn't happen, it, it, it's likely to happen in some jurisdictions. We've seen that in the past, although it's been more Republican lawyers than people with you know, carrying arms where you have open carry. We got to watch that. And then we got to defend the election like the Democrats should have done in Florida in 2000. You know, they had the Brooks Brothers riot where all the Republican, uh, you know, staffers from Washington went down there and were banging on the door, stop the count. It's, you know, being rigged. And uh, Gore and Lieberman, was that, was it Lieberman that year? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, they called off. They said, don't demonstrate. You know, Sharpton, Jackson, everybody. Was, Angela Walker was down there. That was her first real engagement in a presidential election, uh -huh. trying to, you know, get the vote counted in Florida. She was a bus driver back then in uh, driving a Greyhound bus. And uh, so we got to be out there. And if, uh, I don't know if Biden's going to fall as easily because they've been forewarned and they've sort of said we're going to defend the election. But uh -huh. We need to, you know, have mass support for a full and accurate count. So I think that's something we got to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then we got to demand. And uh, this goes if Biden's elected, it goes even if Trump's in there. You know, we need to demand that the FBI and DHS, and I know it's hard for us to say this, but 
they should be doing what the Union Army was supposed to do during Reconstruction. And that is uh, monitor and suppress white terrorists and protect you know, black people's civil rights. Mm -hmm. And the FBI is too focused on you know, immigrants and Isl Islamic people as a terrorism threat and not what has been, and they know are the biggest terrorists now are these white racists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, both DHS and uh, FBI, we should demand that they do that. Mm -hmm. And of course, if we had a green and socialist government, uh, we would we would probably, you know, clean house in a lot of these agencies like Border Patrol, uh, which probably should be abolished along with ICE mm -hmm. and reconstituted as a, a border agency that actually implements the law. Because we know from those Facebook pages that half the Border Patrol was on that racist, misogynistic Facebook page mm -hmm. where they were saying, you know, really terrible things about immigrants and women. And uh, those are the people that volunteered or some of them as the agents that went into Portland mm -hmm. where they were snatching people off the street. And Border Patrol can do that. I, you know, I live in Syracuse, New York within a hundred miles of the Canadian border. And they come down there and they're, they're asking people to show their papers, mm -hmm. which, you know, what kind of country do we have where you're just walking down the street or particularly they go to the regional transportation center and anybody that looks like they're black or brown gets asked to show their papers. Mm -hmm. so we we got a clean house and then while i'm at it i'll say we got to do the same thing in the police departments we know these white racist groups have been uh urging their people to get into police departments as well as the military and uh we've seen cooperation in some of these demonstrations like they shut down the mission oregon uh, legislature and this is over a climate bill. And then we've seen a bunch of them over the, you know, the uh, lockdowns and the masks and so forth in about, I don't know, eight or 10 states. People show up armed and the police do nothing and, and intimidate legislators. Meanwhile, Black Lives Matter goes out there, nonviolent peaceful march, and they decide to put a curfew on and then break it up with tear gas and batons and flash grenades and you name it, pepper spray. Mm -hmm. So what Angela and I have been talking about is we got to demand more than just use of force reforms. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a chokehold ban in New York City since 93. It didn't help Eric Garner, who 20 years later was suffocated to death with a mm -hmm. chokehold. We got to bring the, the we got to stop the police from policing themselves through internal affairs and bring them under community control. Mm -hmm. We should have a police commission that the Panthers used to say elect them. More recently, some people have been saying, let's select them by lot like we do juries. Mm -hmm. So the politics are out of electing these commissions and then they have the power to hire and fire the police chief to review the people that are on the force for racism and sadism and then set the policies and budgets and then independently investigate and discipline misconduct. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and if we don't do that and the police continue to police themselves, they're gonna get away with these crimes, mm -hmm. the assaults and the murders and this racket called civil asset forfeiture, mm -hmm. which is a slush fund for the police. I mean, that's unbelievable that that's mm -hmm. still on the books and they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the, some of the things people can do to work on the campaign, the people that either can't or are uncomfortable going out doing the normal campaign work because of COVID, you know, knocking on doors, things like that. Well, phone canvassing, and we have a phone banking operation in the campaign. They should go to the website, howiehawkins.us, click on the volunteer form, and then click check the box on uh, phone banking. That's something people can do. Um, they can do it on their own through their, you know, local organization. And like I was talking about earlier, we're taking names, you know, we want to know who says they're likely or will vote for us. And then on election day, or really the weekend before, right up to election day, we, we start saying, okay, the election's on Tuesday, have you voted? In fact, you can start doing that now with a lot of mail-in balloting going mm -hmm. on and depends on the state. So that's really the, the, the most concrete way we can, you know, maximize our vote. 
and now we're we got basically seven weeks left or is it six now yeah uh, it's like six or six seven and a half yeah six on tuesday yeah okay <laughs> so yeah so you know and the voting started in a lot of states so it's yeah. you know now's the time to get that vote out mm -hmm. so yeah people can get on the phone our campaign has lists mm -hmm. and they can plug you in um and i don't mind you know if there's a socialist party local wants to do their own initiative mm -hmm. take their own names please share the names with us so we can do the national messaging mm -hmm. the new contacts but uh, use that for your own organizing so what's the last um, six weeks going to look like for you and Angela now that you're in the home stretch? Well, we're going to keep trying to get uh, our policy messages out. I have uh, some uh, proposals on tax reform, a wealth tax, a state tax, an income tax, more progressive than, you know, Warren and Sanders on the wealth tax. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, we got to, we're working on exactly what will we cut to get 75% cuts in military spending mm -hmm. that's another you know thing we want to get out um and you know we'll comment on issues as they come up as we have mm -hmm. been so that's one thing and the other thing is uh helping greens and socialists and anybody supporting the campaign mm -hmm. do the nuts and bolts of election voter id and get out the vote mm -hmm. voter id identification and gotv get out the vote mm -hmm. That's really the next six weeks emphasis. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it doesn't stop then. Then we mm -hmm. like look at what happened and start talking about what our next steps are. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what issues can we move? What kind of organization do we need to develop? Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the immediate thing, okay. you know, voter ID, get out mm -hmm. the vote. And the campaign will do as much messaging as we can. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have got some nibbles, uh, Morning Joe on MSNBC uh, in a couple of weeks may have me on if uh, they stick to their offer or their plan or whatever mm -hmm. it's been. Um, and I think we may get a few more like that, but, you know, that's going to be, it's not the main narrative. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, human interest side story. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do, we'll make the most of it, but... Uh, that's hard. So we'll put out the message at least to the, you know, people in the movement mm -hmm. and, you know, lay out some policy standards that we can keep fighting on. All right. And just to wrap it up, since this is a campaign after all, if anyone listening would like to donate a few dollars to the campaign, how might they go about doing that? You can do it online at howiehawkins.us. You get there. There's always a donate button somewhere on the page or wherever you go on the website, mm -hmm. pretty much. And if you want to send a check rather than do it online, mm -hmm. uh, the donate page tells you how to do that. You know, where to mail the mm -hmm. address, address it to a, a campaign account is Howie mm -hmm. Hawkins 2020. Mm -hmm. And if anyone's looking to donate more, um, you can also go to socialistparty-usa.org. You can donate to both, that, that would be nice. Um, but I think that don't see any more questions. I think that wraps it up. I want to thank Howie for calling in after his long weekend of campaigning in the city. Uh, I want to thank yeah, I want to thank everyone who um, called in this evening as well as attended all of our workshops throughout the weekend. Um, again, our first virtual national organizing conference. Usually we'd be off somewhere doing this. Uh, but we had a great weekend. I believe all of our workshops, if you missed any of them, were, are going to be on our website soon. So you can catch them after the fact. But I want to thank everyone for attending, everyone who held a workshop this weekend, and special thanks to Greg Payson, um, the blank screen below Howie and I, um, our national secretary who um, did a lot of the logistics and running, um, running all the workshops this weekend, uh, Zoom and all that. But that is about it. So Howie, thanks again for calling in, and have a good night, everyone. And thanks for having me, and I'm glad you had an organizing conference, because there's no such thing as an unorganized socialist. <laughs> I hope not anyway. <laughs> All right. Thank okay. you. Have a good night, everyone.